Good morning. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our presentation as part of the We Value Nature 10 day business challenge. So I'm still letting a few people in, um, but we'll get underway as soon as we can. So in the meantime, uh, I'll just introduce you to the We Value Nature 10 day challenge and uh, make sure you're aware of it. So the 10 day challenge is an event which supports and encourages concrete change, changes for nature through a series of action orientated event like today's presentation. And um, it's day six of the challenge currently. So without further ado, you can sign up to those challenges for the next four days and that will help you on your natural capital journey. Um, you can also still register for other sessions that are currently ongoing. So we've got a lot of people who are joining today and We'd like to thank the sponsors of We Value Nature. So that's the support of the European Commission uh, and also the partners WBCSD, ICAW, IUCN, OPLA and the Capitals Coalition. So this session is about natural capital accounting for organisations and it's going to be presented by myself and Eje from FTEC. Um, so we'll just kick off with a few introductions. So my name is Stephanie Heim. I work for a company called Little Blue Research. We uh, help companies measure and value their environmental and social impacts. And I'm on the call today because I'm one of the technical committee that is helping write uh, the standard that's currently being drafted. And I'm joined by Eje. Eje, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, Steph. Um, I'm Eje Özdemirolu. I'm an environmental economist and a founding director of FTEC, uh, Economics for the Environment Consultancy. Um, we do similar work to Steph. In fact, we worked together in the past many times. Um, and I'm the convener of the panel of experts of which Steph is a member for British Standards Institute that has drafted the standard that we're going to talk to you about. Cool. And Sabina, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sabina. I'm an analyst at Little Blue Research. Uh, and today I'll just be sending any useful links in the chat and collating your questions for the Q&A. Uh, so do be sure to ask away in the chat and hopefully we'll get around to you at the end. Fantastic. OK, so we're going to kick off with a couple of house rules. Um, please stay on mute. Uh, obviously, when we get to the Q&A, uh, Q&A is being um, put through the chat, but we might invite you to, to comment, especially if we don't get the thread of the question. Um, also, it helps us if you uh, include in your username your organisation. Um, it's just something that helps us see your perspective, especially if you're, you're asking us questions. Um, submitting questions on the chat throughout so that Sabina can collate them for us towards the end of the session. And please note the session is being recorded. We will share the recording, poll outputs and a summary of details with We Value Nature and those will be available on the We Value Nature website. Uh, that polling that I've spoken about is going to be uh, conducted on the Menti uh, website so um, make sure you're happy to use that we will put the link in the chat as and when it is needed so what are we covering today well initially we're going to do a little bit of an overview of the British Standards Institute and the timeline for the standard development uh, I'm then going to hand over to Eje to talk about the draft standard give you a bit of an overview then going to be knocked back to me where I'm going to talk through some of the natural counting, natural capital accounting outputs and what they might look like. Ed is then going to follow up with a quick case study. And then finally, based on some of the questions we got from um, 
and registrations and during the development of the standards, we're going to talk about the links between this standards, other initiatives and standards just a little bit towards the end. Uh, we're then going into a Q&A session. So what's the BSI? Well, the British Standards Institute is the UK's national standards body and um, effectively it is the group who put together our responses as a UK inter international standards from a national perspective. So as an example, the UK's inputs into the development of an ISO standard would be um, done through the BSI standards body. Uh, they have a royal charter and they have about 12,000 committee members who are all working on the development of standards. Standards being an agreed way of doing something to create a benchmark and um, all of BSI's standards are voluntary. It doesn't mean that those standards don't get taken up or pieces of those standards don't get taken up by regulation at some later point, but for the BSI, all of those are, are voluntary. They're used across multiple sectors, supply chains and all different kinds of things. And they're written by national experts. So what about the timeline for this standard? Well, the panel of experts drafted the standard. We're going to come on to some of the companies and people who are involved in a minute. And we're currently finalising our outputs and finalising standards um, based on a two month long public consultation. Uh, we got quite a lot of feedback. It was extremely technical in nature, actually. Um, which was great. And at the moment, we are in that final drafting phase. The next step is for the final standard to be published in May of this year. OK, so here is a look at some of the people, organisations that have been involved or representative from organisations. So um, Capitals Coalition, also ICAW, ACOM, RAP, many more that are not listed on here as well. So um, it's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea as to the level of engagement we've had with different representatives. Uh, hand over to Edge now, and she can take you through an overview of natural capital accounting. Thank you, Steph. Um, I thought I by mistake pressed to leave the Zoom. So <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I wasn't pressing the wrong wrong button. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank, thank you very much for Steph for, for that introduction. Um, it's been, as, as Steph said, a, a two and a half year journey so far from the proposal to BSI board um, to where we are today. Um, and it's um, loads of things are happening this month, um, including the the um, drivers that are behind a standard like this going all the way to United Nations national accounting standards that's also talking about natural capital accounting and that also came out this month. Um, um, as Steph said I'll, I'll just take you through uh, some principles that we worked with and, and the purpose of putting this account together and some key key aspects of it. Standards usually come after a particular critical mass of practice has accumulated so you can learn from practice what good looks like. In this case we're in a special position where if if you like standard is coming just behind the the leaders the frontier businesses and organizations who tried natural capital accounting and with a particular purpose to encourage more uptake. And that has been our aim to try and create an account that, um, uh, that, that's encouraging, but also um, lays out the principles and comparability. Traditionally, why is this happening now, um, except for March 2021 being a wonderful month for us account, natural accountants? Um, it's happening now after the last few years, um, loads of different div div uh, developments have come together. Um, the view, traditional view that we had um, across all 
stakeholders and parts of society that nature is something that's freely available it's substitutable sometimes um, or more often than it probably is it's it, it'll maintain itself it'll be fine or it's someone else's responsibility to look after that view is changing for various reasons um, the three main reasons that is sort of linked to the accounting work is is that um, individuals consumer demand is changing um, they, they not only want more um, environmentally friendly products that they can consume, but they also want um, better performance from the companies they, they purchase from. They want better financial products as well. Um, and policy is responding to this in the UK, especially um, we've started to be much more um, mindful of the money we invest in maintaining nature and what impact it's generating. Uh, we want to improve the measurement of the public benefits that we generate. And the finance is also responding to that demand and various other drivers um, that they respond to, but increased awareness of risks, natural risks to, to the assets that they invest in and desire to diversify investments um, and invest in nature directly as an as an asset category. All this means that there is potential to create new markets, there's potential to, to channel more funding to look after the environment, um, but also all this needs better measurements, better understanding of metrics and comparability across different disciplines and stakeholders. And this is where the accounting framework and um, all the different data that it can pull together help uh, the practitioners. We work, uh, there are many subtly different definitions of natural capital and other capitals. Um, in the standard, um, we picked a, a definition that's very close to the natural capital protocols definition, um, but we, d we didn't uh, debate that debate that's already happened for a long time. The key to know that whilst we're talking about natural capital accounts, um, the benefits and the, the impact that we try and measure through the accounting do reach out to all the other benefits. They either stem because from those benefits or we can generate benefits, sorry, capitals, or we can generate benefits that enhances other capitals. And you'll see some examples of that as we go through. Um, and clients as they, um, um, you know, we're consultants ultimately, so I always refer to clients, whichever organization they are. Clients that are doing their natural capital accounts immediately start thinking about social capital um, as well if they haven't done so already. Um, so we had a delicate balance um, to, to achieve when we were drafting uh, the standard and I hope the final standard um, Will, will not embarrass us. Um, we know that it's a multidisciplinary effort. We had to even around the panel of experts learn to speak each other's language, um, but there's a lot of benefit in bringing these different groups together. Um, we wanted to ensure um, that the standard can help remove one of the barriers for wider use of natural capital. And that barrier is um, not knowing what good looks like and not in, uh, making sure that the accounts that an individual organization produces is comparable to accounts produced by other organizations and also comparable over time for a given organization. So comparability is very important. We wanted to make sure that um, there is a a flexible entry point to the accounting process. So everyone, however little their data is, however new they are to this topic, they can try putting a natural capital account together and learn from that process. However, that should not, that flexibility should not lead to misrepresentation of the position of a any organization and it also should not be in a way that it misleads the management decisions that will be under t uh, will be made based on the findings of the accounting so you have encouragement role uptake role but you have also um, a, a, a control over the process so you can um, 
deliver comparability and we do this with like other standards do um, we have control over the documentations we require from the people preparing the accounts um, they can make assumptions uh, they will have gaps in their data but they need to document everything they do when they prepare the account so it's very clear what's in what's out the requirements in the standards is, is prepared for the people who will prepare the accounts, but also the same requirements can be used as a checklist for if any auditing is to be done. But it's not a reporting standard. It's a standard that, to help um, people prepare accounts. This is the scope, uh, sorry, the, the table of contents, clauses of the, of the standard. We will not go through in detail every one of them. Um, but it's important to point out that we're not only talking about the mechanics of putting the accounts together, but also process and the principles of putting the accounts together. And we try to respond to many comments we received during uh, before and during the public consultation by putting some examples in informative annexes as well. Who is this for? There are two types of groups the standard is written for. One is the group who will prepare the accounts um, and one who will benefit from reading the accounts. Um, so this is not only a bookkeeping exercise, if you like, but it's also a management account and engagement exercise. When we talk about organizations, we mean all organizations they could be public third sector listed unlisted private um, it's open to all sectors because we believe all sectors are dependent on natural capital and impact on natural capital in some way or scale um, and it's also opened to collaborations by that we mean several organizations several companies businesses or public sector sharing a, an asset um, benefiting from an asset could prepare a joint account. And we're already in the UK seeing examples of this at the catchment levels where water companies and other um, stakeholders are coming together trying to um, find the, the, the most efficient way of uh, maintaining the catchment but also continuing to receive the flows of benefits from that catchment. The principles that we adhere to um, and these are the principles of the standard and the principles of preparing the accounts is rigor. Of course, we must use the best available information. Um, we must make sure that our analysis is complete as possible. And that also means recognizing those other capitals, interactions with the other capitals and ensuring that you can collect all the data um, from all sorts of analytical approaches, um, consistency uh, in your assumptions across the accounting effort, but recognizing that actually it will, it's never possible to comp have an entirely complete account um, because nature is very complex. We never have enough data and that's why transparency is possibly the most important standard here um, that documenting all the assumptions and data that you put together. There are two outputs that Steph is going to take us through. Um, we're mimicking financial accounting because our main goal is to ensure that the considerations about impacts and dependencies on nature are integrated in economic financial decision making. So we thought this was a good hook, but it doesn't mean that the balance sheet and income statement are exactly the same way in natural capital accounting as they are in financial accounting. There are differences and you'll see them in the examples. Um, but balance sheet, you can say the purpose is the same um, and it's about our dependencies um, mainly and income statement is about f flows of our impacts. Um, units and period will come clearer um, as we show you examples. Um, there are two scopes to, to the standard. Um, this is our flexibility um, approach. So we realize that it's a, it could be a daunting task for organizations who are starting in this journey. So we said, look, you have to include all the assets that you have immediate responsibility for. Um, we might improve that wording, but that means that the assets that you own or you have legal or voluntary responsibility um, or in some cases perhaps influence over. 
those need to be in scope one um, of either of the accounts that you produce. Scope two is the rest. So we use shall as the rule of the standard. You shall do scope one accounts um, to say that you have used the, this um, BSI standard and everything else is, is a bonus. Um, of course, you have to report uh, or you have to document uh, which scope is your account is in. Um, what, what kind of um, questions can this kind of natural capital account help you answer? There's some examples here. There's a very long list. Um, but if you are wondering what assets do you have or depend on, what benefits do they provide for your organization and also rest of the society, then balance sheet is a good place to start. And I would start in scope one. Um, and if you're wondering what impacts you have um, and your operations, etc., cetera, um, then income statement is the one to do. Um, we're working on bringing these, thing, these two accounts together, how they speak to each other and then how they speak to financial accounting as well. And one advantage is to be able to repeat things over time and see what's changing with your operations, with your investment, uh, with your decisions. Um, it, it is in short, I'm wrapping up, <laughs> Steph, um, it's in short um, a, a systematic way of collating biophysical, socioeconomic and financial data. At the moment, you might be collating that collecting such data but you might be reporting it under different in different reports. You may not be collecting them all. Accounting is an opportunity to bring them all together. That process shows you what you know and what you don't know. Um, what you need to prioritize, what's material for your business. And it also, it bookends your decision making about your impacts and dependencies. At the beginning, you can use the accounting to establish a baseline. Um, you could take decisions, you could invest in things. And then at the end or throughout that, you can use accounting as a monitoring and evaluation tool as well. We've covered that, that in the clauses, because as I said at the beginning, we don't want this to be just about calculations. We want this to be about processes. We'd like the accounts to become really integral to organizations decision making not a tick box exercise of producing an account and publishing it um, and that's why we're not we, we don't make a re requirement about going external with these accounts so these are covered in the standard and we'll we'll talk about them perhaps in the q a and that's over to you steph hope i didn't Brilliant. go too much over my time <laughs> no we are okay so what does an account look like? Hopefully you guys can see my screen. And um, so what does a natural capital account look like? Well, first of all, what do you need to produce these accounts? They don't come into being without a lot of work behind the scenes. And there are a number of different schedules that you need to complete before you can produce a balance sheet or a natural capital income statement. I'm not going to go through all of these um, today, but maybe just uh, pick out one or two interesting points here. So the natural capital asset register, it's really identifying the assets that the company is dependent on. And then that risk register is looking at, at what risks those assets are, are potentially facing. Um, if this is going to help you decide, will help you look at the scope and the boundary of your account and your balance sheet in this case. And also it's going to help you decide what elements to, to focus on in more detail. The physical flow account and monetary flow accounts Physical flows looking at the, the impacts um, and also the dependencies from a quantitative perspective, but more of a, a biological or ecological type of data. The monetary flow account is concentrating on the, the monetization of those things, either for you as a business or considering the value to society. And we'll we'll talk about that in just a second. So the balance sheet, as AJ said, is it's this longer period of time. Uh, it's looking at your dependencies over 20 to 50 years and, and seeing what that might do. Um, 
to your natural capital assets, how they might change, how the services they provide might change. The income statement is much more of a snapshot. So this is looking at a point in time, a year in time, and we'll, we'll go through those. And it's impact focus. So as an organization, you could have enhanced natural capital in one year, spent money that led to a positive impact. You'll also be using um, particular assets in a way that may lead to deteriorations. So there's a little bit of nuance between the two things. They are also linked, but we'll come on to that when we go through our examples. So as I've just mentioned, the, um, the balance sheet provides a view over the long term. Um, and it's really about assets and liabilities, both to the organization and for the rest of the society. This is why it's different to trying to put natural capital accounting into financial accounts where value to the organization is what's being covered. Um, there are other linkages, but we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So information on the monetary value of each natural capital asset is included. So that might be a forest or farmland or some other asset, natural capital asset type. And then it's going to depend on the scope of your account as to what's included. We've also got information on the cost associated with maintaining those natural capital assets so that those benefits can continue to be supplied. And ideally, the balance sheet shall report monetary values. Again, it's, it's to try to integrate this information into decision making that has tended to focus on um, on financial values. However, where that's not possible, partial coverage of benefits or quantitative matrix and uh, metrics and qualitative descriptions shall be used. So we're not saying you can't use other forms of measurement. It's just that monetary is the priority at the moment. OK, so here we've got a little bit of a hypothetical example to illustrate the structures completely fictitious um, and here we've got our assets so the assets are described as, as the habitat types in this particular example there is some flexibility we don't exactly set out how you have to describe your assets we don't set out how much time you have to use either you may decide you want to look over 50 years and you might not have all of the values for each asset um, so total asset values uh, are underlined here. So you're adding up all of these different benefits and where you can't sum them together, you've got your quantitative data alongside. You've then got a net asset value. So you're minusing your different liabilities. So all the costs to maintain each of these different assets. Um, this particular example doesn't include the value chain, but you could make things more complicated by thinking about assets that aren't directly under your control, part of the supply chain. It's one of the things we wanted to cover um, for organisations that were global and using more complex supply chains than those, um, than those had, that had been used before. So here's a natural capital income statement and again it, it's just bringing out the fact that it's a one-year focus snapshot and um, included in that we've got our information on the enhancement of ecosystem services or abiotic services and the use of these services as well so once again we've got an example of our farmland area and forest area and a snapshot of that but it does link to the um, it does link to the balance sheet through the through some of the um, previous links so I'm going to go back to the slide previously to show the link actually so the total um, the link between the two of them. 
is here, this retained lost value piece. And the reason I wanted to bring it up actually is because we have been asked a number of times on the consultation about the different links. So the link between the income statement and the balance sheet is that retained lost value line that sums up over time what's going on on the income statement. So if we just click through back to our example. So we've got our one year and then these can be positive or negative impacts. It's going to be completely dependent on both the scope of your account, but also the actions the company's taking. Do you do enhancements to the, the assets that you own or are you a company that depends on assets that are owned by someone else completely and you have limited influence, in which case, how can you enhance or are you only impacting those assets? So clause six sets out all these different steps that the practitioner will need to undertake. So I've covered them very cursory manner here today. As you can see, there's rather a lot. So there are each of those schedules that you need to produce and then the the account output that you have is structured. And while there is some flexibility, um, basically we're trying to ensure that the process people go through when applying this, uh, this accounting standard or this natural capital accounting standard is the same process. And that documentation shows how they have um, considered that process and the decisions they've made in order to make it to make it happen for them. So next point is that in addition to those schedules, you don't only have to consider those, you've also got to think about the material issues for your company or organisation that's undertaking the account. And you've got to think about data collection and assessment. So the uh, standard does include shall clauses for that. So shall contain information on all natural capital assets, flows, benefits, impacts and dependencies that are material to the organisation and nature. So what do we mean by that? We mean you've got to review relevant documents, you've got to combine these with input from internal and external stakeholders, you've got to think about natural capital issues and come up with a way of prioritising those that are most material um, for your organisation. And, and you have to stand behind that justification and document it transparently. So it, it's not good enough to say, oh, we kind of missed out the issue because we didn't have any information. You can say that, but it, it sort of diminishes, uh, it diminishes maybe what you have in your account and you might want to think about how to get that information for future accounts or understand it as a gap and, and see a way of fixing it in future. Data collection and assessment. Input, output, outcome and impact data are necessary to understand the full extent of impact and dependencies on natural capital. This is tough because basically there is a mix of different data required and we've already shown you that your output can actually have quantitative information and monetary uh, information in it, although monetary is preferred, you're going to have to assess the quality of that data and you're going to under, need to understand who to get that information from within your organisation and external to the organisation. Um, we had some questions about that in the registration uh, process, so we'll, we'll cover that off a little bit in the Q&A when we get to that. So documentation and it's really important actually because it's it's not reporting it's documenting what you have done in a transparent way whether you choose to make that external to your organization or use it internally is up to you but it's about setting out what what has been done to produce this account so the process of preparing accounts, especially the interactions between key decisions. So boundary, how did you decide the boundary? Why are these issues material as opposed to others? What were the lessons learnt when you tried to get data and found some of it was there and some of it that you thought was there wasn't? What's your plan to address it? 
in future years. Um, did you use some alternative scenarios when putting your, your balance sheet together? You're looking over a lengthy period of time. Are you assuming that all services will just continue to be provided as they are today? Or are you trying to capture how those change and, and what were the decisions behind the scenarios that you used? And finally, you're going to interpret that information for management decision making. Um, that interpretation, we do talk about it a bit in the standard. What the standard does not do is tell you what you should do next. That's for someone else. So again, this is just a, a rehash of that last slide and says, OK, if you wanted to have a report that aligned with your natural capital balance sheet and income statement, these are the sections we think uh, would need to be in it, some, some sort of description of each of these things. Okay, so I'm going to hand back to EJ now and she's going to take you through a case study. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Steph. Um, so um, there's a question in the chat to whether we can tell you the names of companies that have um, done accounts. Um, that's a hard one to answer uh, because we all have our own clients that we're working for and some of them are coming external with this and, and most of them aren't. Um, so at FTEC, we've done about 60 plus accounts in the last four years um, for, ever, for all these variety of organizations and including companies, but only a handful of them have gone public with, with those accounts. Um, Duchy of Cornwall is one on agriculture. Forestry Commission has um, is producing theirs every year for the last uh, four years, and you can find them in their um, website. United Utilities has first produced one for their own um, land and then they're now leading a, a catchment based account. Um, but it, but the what we believe is that the, the examples will follow and the standard is ahead of that. Um, and, and we'll see what the practice goes. So the example that I'm going to show to you is, um, is based on a, a forestry investment case. Um, wondering what the returns to forestry would be beyond the financial return which is mostly based on timber. Forests are great natural capital assets. We have a lot of scientific understanding of in general how they work although all of that understanding is very much location specific um, and you can see from here that these are all the sort of ecosystem service benefits that you can potentially get from a forest investment and only the one in the in the kind of maroon color on the top timber and other marketed products would appear in someone's financial account um, all the others are real benefits that are provided but of course they require different types of management regimes um, so the account and if if you use it like a management account for different scenarios you can test different forest management options um, in your investment uh, portfolio and you can change the management options to maximize one benefit over the other um, obviously trees capture carbon they capture air pollutants um, they Look, hold on to soil, look after the soil biodiversity. Um, again, I'm not talking about monoculture just for timber managed forest, of course. Um, and by doing that, they could improve water quality and reduce flood risk reduction downstream. Obviously, habitats for biodiversity, good for landscape. If they're open for recreation um, and amenity, they could provide those benefits to school groups, education, volunteer benefits, etc. It could be zero in any one of these bubbles um, if you're focusing your management on some other thing that doesn't that precludes from providing that benefit. How do we how do we quantify these things? For each of these little circles, you have a lot of scientific information and forest management information. You first count what assets you have. You you use logic chains, impact pathway tools etc the, the words differ from sector to sector and discipline to discipline but we do an asset register you understand the benefits that are provided 
by that particular forest, that particular portfolio of forests, um, and use metrics that are suitable for each bubble in your physical flow. So carbon, you measure in tons of carbon um, per hectare or per per a particular size of tree. Air pollute quality might be um, improved, absorbed air pollution, depends where you are, of course. Um, flood risk reduction might be cubic meters of water the forest holds um, and, and therefore reduces the risk downstream. Recreation could be number of people coming to visit the forest. So all those different metrics suitable to the benefit you're measuring appear in the physical flow accounts that Steph mentioned. And then we try and monetize the values. Why do we want to use money? Because they are comparable to financial and market interactions. It won't be possible to monetize everything, but I'll show you an example um, and the color codes um, are, are here on the slide. So um, I'm going to skip this one, but just this is just shows the coverage of different types of accounting in um, uh, of all the assets and uh, benefits a forest investment could give you. This is the balance sheet that FTEC uses. This is our format. It doesn't mean you have to do it um, like this, if anybody publishes a better format, I will use that. Um, that is improve the, the communal practice. Um, but you read this as a balance sheet, as, as Steph said. So in this case, we have values to the organization, the investor, um, and value to the rest of the society. On top, we have asset values, timber, is based on a 200 hectare planting of mixed, um, mostly conifer species. And it and it's, this number comes from forest timber managers, rotational information. So it's real plan of how, how often they'll cut the, the trees, replant them, etc. cetera. Um, carbon sequestration uses the science and the base uh, social carbon prices because this forest is in England. Um, air quality regulation uses a, a model we developed for the Office of National Statistics that um, um, works, tells us how much air pollution is absorbed by trees and therefore how much risk to health is uh, avoided um, together with CEH at UK. And recreation as well, we use an online model called Oral. So I can take you through for hours about this balance sheet, but it, it on the top, it's the asset values. This is the result. And on the bottom, liabilities, you need to separate production and maintenance costs. And when you do these numbers, what you see, what's important here is to see that if you were looking at this investment in forest only from a more kind of traditional financial return perspective, you would only see... Uh, one here, the bottom line, the value to organization. You wouldn't be able to see everything else that the forest could do um, um, in the same balance sheet. Whether the forest does that or not depends on your management uh, regime. And we've used this for running several investments and management scenarios for the client to show that actually you can get significant additional benefit to the society with minimal additional cost to management. And you could do the comparison across species of tree and time. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Thank we'll you for, for that. That's, um, that's great, Edgy. Um, okay, so we are going to do a quick menti poll for the moment. So what I would like you guys to do, we're going to talk very quickly about standards and guidance. And it is going to be a very quick, um, quick couple of slides because we were slightly over time and there are questions in the chat that I'd like to answer. So what we would like you to do is go on to menti.com use the following code 21456798 and tell us the different types of standards and guidance uh, or developments that you're currently aware of and what you use in your current role. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is Sabina, when you are ready, if you can share the results of that uh, poll, that'd be great. Cool. And while we're waiting, I would say that thanks for the discount point, EJ. That's great. In terms of the data quality uh, questions, um, the standard itself doesn't set out 
the rules for a data quality assessment. What it's um, what it does is say that you would need to go through an assessment of some kind. Um, there are many different kinds of data quality assessment you could you could use to meet that criteria. Um, and then I think we had one other question in terms of dealing with the trade off between multiple benefits. Um, it's a bit of a cop out answer, I'm going to have to say, but I'm going to go back to the standards point that we've made, which is that um, the standard doesn't tell you how to deal with the information that you find or you need to uh, to use um, once you've got your results. I don't know, Ed, if you want to yeah. um, add to that while we're waiting yeah. for some more of these yeah, uh, yeah. guidance to be put. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a it's a funny one to get uh, one's head around a standard, a standard that actually standard setters mean. Um, it's not a guidance. Um, reading this BSI standard, no one who doesn't know how to do valuation accounts or ecosystem statement will be able to pick this standard and start doing the accounts. Um, it's it's not guidance document. It's going to be about 35 pages. Um, it's not going to be hundreds of pages you would need um, to have all these protocols and frameworks in, in within the standard. It, it's a checklist. It's a it's what good looks like. It's while you're doing the accounts, it's on the side of your desk and you go, have I done this right? I've done I've just done my asset register. Have I done it the way that the standard says I should be doing? If I've done it better, all the better. If I've done it worse, um, can I explain why I couldn't do it as as the standard tells me I shall be doing it or should be doing it? So that's that's why the standard is a very narrow document. Um, we also wanted to make sure that it has longevity. Um, we didn't deliberately don't refer to um, say use this X protocol or X framework to do whatever it is um, because things change, methods improve. Um, what's important for the standard that it says the definitions and the principles and a path for you, and then you select when you're use, using the standard to create an account to use the best available and most appropriate protocol. Mm -hmm. So don't be disappointed if you don't see lots of lists of recommendations, you must use X. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for adding nice. to that. I'm just going to um, reference the, the different guidance and standards mm -hmm. and things that have been um, put up here. So we, we've had a few different entries, natural capital protocol coming up uh, top there, but others, I've FRS accounting standard, gold standard, global good, biodiversity impact metrics and so on. What I'm going to do now is just I'm going to take you through a, a very quick uh, summary slide of um, of standards, and it's not exhaustive. But the reason I want to to take you guys through it is is basically to build on Ej's point about why we didn't refer to particular ones is because the development of these different standards, frameworks and guidance is getting pretty intense and there's a whole bunch that are going to start to come out or have started to be released this year. So this list isn't exhaustive, but what I hope it's showing you is that actually there are many different pieces of guidance. They all focus on slightly different things and what we want to do with this standard is to show how it can support you with some of these endeavours. So I do have a few slides, but I'm not going to go through all of them because we're not going to have time to have more questions. So I'll just pick this one. Um, the TCFD and TNFD. So Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures and uh, Task Force for Nature Based Financial Disclosures helping business to manage and report on their dependencies and impacts on either climate or, or nature. Um, the BSI standard is very complementary to this work. So we've used the example of the link of the TCFD and where something like the natural capital accounting output could help in the strategic planning and risk management aspect of TCFD and also the financial impact part of the TCFD. Um, 
when we send the slides out to you guys later, you'll see we have reference SIA, we've referenced IFRS that both came up on the poll, and we also reference Dusk Gupta Review and Integrated Capitals. But I'm going to allow us to go to Q&A for now um, so that we get a bit more of a chance to chat. Mm. Yeah. I think that there's a reference to value balancing alliance, for example, in the chat that um, um, some of these standards that you mentioned, and that's in Steph's um, slide, they some of them are inputs. Um, so some of them tell you how to calculate a particular benefit, um, mm -hmm. and that's great. Some of them are much higher macro level standards and drivers and requirements for reporting, and you could use those input tools and the BSI natural capital accounting to respond to those calls, like the TCFT one, um, and some of them are parallel. Um, so maybe we'll we'll regroup them next time we talk about this in sort of which which standards are inputs, which standards are um, that that BSI is trying to respond to. Fantastic, um, Sabina. If you're on the line, do you want to um, talk through some of the or ask us some of the registration question? I know we've at least addressed some of the ones that have been coming in the chat as we've gone, yeah. but it would be good to do those. Sure. Uh, so one of the questions that we received from someone who registered uh, was, "What are the links between this standard and the other standards and guidance relating to biodiversity?" such as the IFC performance standard six and biodiversity net gain. Cool, um, I'm gonna take that one and it, it's building on that very quick section there that showed the links between our standard, its outputs and, and what it could help with. I think for those two in particular, I will caveat that I'm not an expert in either one of those um, those particular things, but my understanding would be that both the data used for net gain and the IFC performance standard six could help start to be inputted into a natural capital account. The results of something like the balance sheet with different scenarios could actually be used in, in both the net gain example and the IFC performance standard six to, to think about what different options, what different management options might, might look like and what might um, yield better biodiversity outcomes. But as you've also seen, we acknowledge that not every aspect of biodiversity can be um, valued and that is very quick, clearly um, demonstrated by quantitative information being put alongside. Yeah. yeah. In, in some of the accounts, we've used the biodiversity, again, the biodiversity um, units, DEFRA and Natural England have produced in UK um, to give some, some indication, but um, yeah, they're, they're kind of ballpark ass cool. assessments usually. There's a... Mm -hmm. Sabina, uh, so another question. Another. Oh, sorry. Sure, yeah, no worries. <laughs> another question we received, uh, which I think was more directed towards uh, Edna, was how can accounting financial methods apply to natural capital valuation? Um, there is, um, we use a lot of the financial data in the natural capital account. So, I mean, I had one timber here for in the example I used, but in um, in some other cases where there are multiple um, products and services that the organization produces and sells, the, most of the data comes from the financial accounts. The cost data, of course, also comes from uh, financial accounts. For some organizations, it's actually quite difficult to separate what's production cost, what maintenance cost. So you have to talk to a lot with the financial accountants, but also sort of department heads, etc. But in terms of the uh, the, the kind of princ principles are similar, but what we're trying to do in this last phase is to work a little bit more on how you can read across from natural capital balance sheets to income statement, but also how can you read across from the natural capital accounts to financial accounts. Um, and and that's the, the, the biggest um, improvement 
to the standard that you saw, if you saw it in the public consultation, that you'll see it once it's published. Um, we are we are looking at um, IFRS um, standards to make references to. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and another question we received uh, was how are standards considering the data that natural resource asset managers can feasibly collect and process? Um, so I guess that we may have already covered a bit of that, but um, I think, Eje, you also said that people have a lot more data than they think they have yes. from the outset. But uh, maybe yeah. one extra thing that I'd reference is the UNCEA data and the national yeah. data sets that are starting to become available from national counts. Um, that would also be quite useful as part of this process to developing an organization's natural capital yeah. account outputs. Yeah, yeah, I think we, this, this is, think of natural capital accounting as a systemic way of bringing all the data together. I think it's the, the focus should be on the process of preparing the accounts, not on the, the balance sheet that, um, that you are not solely on the balance sheet or income statement you produce at the end because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of learning through that process. Cool and the last question that we received from registrants before we go over to some of the questions that people asked in the chat uh, was how does this differ from other standards out there and why should this one be used above all others? <laughs> I think that is a tough question. <laughs> But, um, and I don't want to shy away from it, but what, what we're going to do when releasing the standard is to try and show where those links are and where, where there's complementarity. This is one way of doing a natural capital uh, account. There are um, a couple of other models under development. I think the BSI one is going to launch um, launch first in terms of it being a, a particular standard that people can actually go look and uh, sort of follow really quite exacting steps um, for. So mm -hmm. why would it be better than than any other? Well, it completely depends on the context of what you're using it for. So, um, you know, if you want to bring together your data in a structured manner to look at how you're impacting and depending on natural capital for an organization, then this is a, a pretty good way of doing that and enabling that process. And it gives you some quite good guidance about the steps you need to do to get there. What it doesn't do is tell you how you must do those steps because that will depend on the different methods and information and scope of your accounts. So I think um, it's a good complementary piece of work to a number of the developments that are out there. And, and that's what we've strived to do, not produce something new, but build on what's already um, been in use and been proved to be working. And where it's not proved to be working, try to, to improve it. I don't know, Ajay, if you want to add anything on to that. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, I'll 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 add a, a bolder statement that this is the only state state standard that's coming out from a national standards institution, mm. um, and um, the the most famous um, ISO standard, the most used ISO standard in the world is fourteen thousand and one. Uh, environmental management standard and the origins of that was as a BSI standard. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to shoot for the moon. One day there will be an accounting standard from ISO with all the accountancy bodies around the world signing up to it. And um, I sincerely hope together with all the practice, not just us, but all the practice gathering in the community, we will achieve that one day. Look, we had a statement two weeks ago from UN saying GDP is not enough. Um, we can do natural capital accounting for organizations as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, um, actually, what I'm going to do is we're bob on 11 o'clock, so I'm going to wrap it up there. But what I am going to ask EJ to do is just quickly um, say that Envicon is happening tomorrow. <laughs> Yes. So, Ajay, do you want to talk about Envicon and, and what's going um, on there? 
Yeah, there is. Um, uh, this is Enmacon. Um, there is. It's our annual environmental applied environmental economics conference, um, and it's still open for registration. It's free. If you search for Acne Enmacon 2021, you'll find it. Um, but we are we have um, a keynote speaker from the um, head of United uh, Environmental Economics Accounting at UN Statistics Division, um, and then a session on um, from various experts or from national accounting to organizational accounting um, on session one, um, macroplastics and marine in session three, and help with communicating lots of complex evidence to wider audiences in session four. Session two is um, a kind of UK and Europe focused on how we are using economic economics in, in practice for environment. Fantastic. Do you want to just, I can see you're showing your screen. Do you want to bump it to the next slide for me? It's, um, yeah. so it, we, uh, Sabina and I are going to be on the communities hub that has just been um, put into the chat. We'll take any further questions there. We'll try and answer them on the, on the group. If we can't, we will be producing outputs of this session in any case. So we will come back to you. I know there are a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to, but hopefully um, you found the session useful. The slides will be uh, available as will those outputs in a couple of uh, in a couple of days time on the We Value Nature website. And lastly, please provide this session with feedback. It would be nice to be asked to speak again. If you don't provide us with feedback, we can't guarantee that that will happen. So it would be awesome if you could do that. <laughs> and the link is in the chat. So thank you very much for attending today. And we hope you found it really useful. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. All right. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.